The ground shakes beneath you. The pictures rattle on the walls. You hear a rumble off in the distance. Then, boom, a deafening explosion. The shockwave blasts through the windows and sets off car alarms. You duck under the dining table for cover, but then you remember you live not far from a supervolcano in the middle of a tropical jungle. So staying in one place isn't a good idea. The shaking finally halts. You take this chance to peek outside and see a giant cloud of smoke covering the sky. It's lunchtime, but you wouldn't know it. The sun is completely veiled and darkness falls. The power's out in the whole city. In this darkness, you see red molten lava shooting from the sky and spilling on the rim. You run outside along with dozens of your neighbors. Your priority right now? Find safe shelter and fast. You think about taking the car, but with everyone running on the road, that's a no-go. So you run on foot where the crowd is going. Super volcanoes are in a league of their own when it comes to natural disasters. Surprisingly, it's not all about size or height. A volcano is dubbed super if it erupts more than 240 cubic miles of magma. That's more than enough to overfill Lake Erie. It must also have a history of erupting and a magnitude of 8 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index. The largest active volcano on Earth is Hawaii's Mauna Loa. It's so big, it would cover the entire state of Rhode Island plus some. And next time you see a commercial plane flying high in the sky, remember that 30,000-some-foot altitude is about as tall as Mauna Loa is from base to summit. It's technically taller than Everest when you measure it like that, yet it's not considered a supervolcano. So you're running along the dark road not knowing and barely seeing where to go. Then, all of a sudden, a massive flaming boulder smashes through the bridge in front of you. You and everyone else are now stranded on the side of the volcano as it's getting more chaotic each second. Most of the crowd disperses, finding their own ways to safety. You remember there's a way to the other side not many people know about. But you'll have to cross a raging river through the dense jungle. You calm what's left of the crowd, and everyone follows you to your secret getaway. You finally get out of the city limits and head into the jungle. With the sky already dark, the tall trees and thick leaves make it almost pitch black. Everyone gets out their phone flashlights to navigate through the dark path. You all need to stick together and make sure nobody gets lost. Suddenly, fiery rocks strike the trees not far from you. Everyone jolts and tries to rush ahead. But nowhere is safe when it's raining scalding fire all around. You and your group have to pick up the pace or else. Imagine a typical avalanche or mudslide. Very dangerous situations on their own. Now, imagine an avalanche of lava rocks and lava sliding down a mountain instead of mud. That's what's making its way towards you right now. More and more people catch up with your group and bring news that the entire neighborhood is submerged in lava. It's traveling quicker than you thought. You can never really predict how fast a lava flow will be until you see it. It all depends on how thick it is and how steep the mountain slope. Lava can move slowly at about 20 feet a minute, a fraction of the average person's walking speed. Or it can flow as fast as 30 miles per hour, which even the fastest person on Earth can't outrun. But the lava isn't even the most dangerous problem. If you didn't have protection, the gases spewing from the eruption would fill your lungs, and those spread faster and further than the lava flow. Your eyes and throat would be itchy. You'd get a headache, dizziness, increased heart rate, difficulty breathing. The worst would be passing out from the lack of oxygen. Luckily, everyone managed to grab their gas masks before leaving their homes. You're now entering the treacherous terrain of the jungle and the danger zone. Everyone's phone batteries are giving out one by one, so your vision is even more limited. The terrain is tougher, and you can't hear any sounds from the river. At this point, you're not even sure if you're going the right way. But your instincts tell you the deeper you go, the safer you'll be. The path is muddy, and the vines are hindering everyone's movements. That's when you hear something big running through the jungle. It's coming up on you fast. You can't see a thing until it's right up on you. A bear! And there goes a rhino! Wild cats, domestic cats, dogs, different creatures of all sizes and species, they all come running through the jungle right past you. You and your fellow humans aren't the only ones fleeing from the eruption. The rumbling is still going on. Before you know it, a shower of fire rocks strikes right behind you and ignites parts of the jungle. 
There's no going back. Everyone picks up and runs for it. You hear thunder in the distance. A flash of lightning lights up the dark sky. You think, finally, some rain to wash away this fiery nightmare. But that's not a regular storm brewing. These giant smoke clouds can mimic a thunderstorm under similar conditions. Your luck finally pays off. You hear the river straight ahead. You reach the bank and have to hop on some stones to get to the other side. You almost slip when someone from the group catches you just in time. Whew, that was too close. Not far down the river is a large waterfall leading straight to a shallow lake with sharp rocks at the bottom. The ash from the lava falls like snow, covering most of the trees and landing on the river. Ash is one of the most dangerous things about volcanic eruptions. You're soaked to the bone, but it's a lot better than ash and smoke. And then the rest of the group follow. The next thing you know, the river starts steaming as lava meets the bank and runs into the water. You try your best to speed things up. The lava can heat this water up to dangerous levels, and there are still people slowly crossing the river on the slippery rocks. Luckily, you manage to get everyone across. Well, almost everyone. You turn around and see someone's leg got caught between two rocks. The lava continues to pour into the river. You can feel the heat of the steam. You rush back to this person and try to pull them out. Their leg won't bud. Someone else from the group comes to help, and you're finally able to pull them out in the nick of time. You and everyone else, now exhausted from your trek, keep going as far as possible. That's when you see the main road that connects you to the broken bridge. There are others on the road that got out safely, and even some cars filling up with survivors and heading fast out of the area. The volcano is still spewing lava, and the entire city is flooded with it. What was once your town now looks like a giant burning lake. Planes and helicopters can't fly because of the smoke and ash, so don't count on an air rescue. You're still at risk even though you're on safer ground, so it's still too early to celebrate. Everyone continues to move away from the city. The further, the better. The ground continues to shake, but this time it's even more intense than before. Supervolcanoes are powerful enough to cause many earthquakes. But it's a good thing you're out in the open, far from the buildings and debris in the city. Now, back to reality. Rest assured that a volcanic eruption of this intensity won't happen for a very long time, as in millions of years. Besides, thanks to warning systems and humanity's preparation for such an event, it's extremely rare for even a regular volcano to do as much damage as it could. So, don't scratch Yellowstone off your travel list just yet. When we think of active volcanoes, one region comes to mind. The Ring of Fire in the Pacific Ocean. Three quarters of Earth's volcanoes sit within this belt. Compare the area to Australia, which doesn't have any volcanic activity. The old continent of Europe is also calm. Or at least, we like to think so. Can you guess what the most active volcano in Europe is? If you thought of Mount Etna on the island of Sicily in Italy, you were right. The volcano has erupted about 200 times and has been far from sleeping in recent decades. The last time this happened was in August 2023. The highest mountain in the Mediterranean is half a billion years old. But in Iceland, there is a much younger volcano. It sprang into action on the 10th of July, 2023. In the afternoon, three fissures appeared in the ground on a peninsula in the southwest of the island. This was at a base of a small mountain peak. Its name means little ram in the local language. The volcano spewed molten lava high into the air. There were also gas plumes in the area. But the scientific community wasn't surprised by the event. They already knew about the volcanic area that stretches between the cities of Reykjavik and Keflavik. Its name is hard to pronounce. Hey, I want to buy a vowel. It had already erupted during the previous two summers. This activity came after eight centuries of dormancy. In the days leading up to the latest eruption, seismologists, the scientists who study earthquakes, recorded over 12,000 tremors. When the ground opened up in July, the fissures were over a mile and a half long. The following morning, two of them closed. All the lava was now coming out of the last fissure. It grew into an elongated cone. 
the simplest shape of volcano we are all familiar with. The lava soon filled a large crater. It grew almost 100 feet tall during the first week, and it is still growing. On the night when the eruption started, lava spread out in all directions. Its cinders set ablaze the dry moss in the vicinity. Local authorities closed off the surrounding area. There were toxic gases from the volcanoes and smoke from the burning moss. Firefighters flocked to the area. After a week, they proclaimed the area safe. Visitors soon came to witness the birth of Europe's youngest volcano. This form of tourism is quite developed in Iceland. People come from all over the world to watch active volcanoes. The land of fire and ice is home to more than 130 volcanoes. Some 30 of them are active. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. Is volcano tourism safe? In Iceland, it is. The country's authorities research and constantly monitor all of the hotspots. The island is dotted with several dozen seismic stations. These help researchers accurately predict future eruptions. And emergency services are accustomed to these sorts of events. They can quickly cordon off danger zones. This is what happened in 2010. A volcano in the south of the island, the name of which everyone struggled to pronounce, erupted. It spewed out a plume of steam and ash that was 7 miles high. Uh, this wasn't a fun time to be an air traveler. Winds carried the enormous plume southeast toward northern Europe. Many countries closed their airspace for several days for safety reasons. The volcano erupted in March, but the Earth was shaking from January the same year. So seismologists knew that an eruption was approaching. When it comes to the continent's youngest volcano, the tourist infrastructure is already there. Visitors can leave their cars at a designated parking lot. Then they go on a five-hour-long trek. This leads to a viewing deck. Tourists are so close to the epicenter that they can feel the heat haze from the crater. The sight is the most impressive at nighttime. Safety is never a concern. Scientists regularly chart out hazard maps that outline the borders of lava fields. This way, visitors who stick by the rules are never in harm's way. More than a week after the eruption started, a section of the crater collapsed. Lava flowed downhill west of the volcano. This majestic smoldering hot river is slow-moving lava. Scientists categorize it as an a-a type. The term is Hawaiian. It describes basaltic lava that has a rough and brittle surface. The flow is composed of broken lava blocks that are called clinkers. They fall off as the substance flows. This reveals red-hot areas. The cooler sections of lava are gray and black in color. When it moves forward, it produces a distinctive sound like shattering glass. Nearly a month after the eruption of the new volcano, we got aerial footage of an interesting phenomenon. A tornado formed directly over the lava flow. This occurs due to the high temperatures in the area. When the conditions are right, a column of heated air can easily turn into a mini-tornado. Scientists observed a similar event happen during the 2018 eruption of Mount Kilauea in Hawaii. The lava fields of Europe's second-largest island tell the story of the creation of Iceland. It sits above the place where the North American and Eurasian plates meet each other. Tectonic plates are huge, rocky chunks of Earth's most outer layer. There are roughly 20 of them. They rest on a partially molten layer of rock. All the lava we see on the surface starts its journey here. You could say that these plates float on molten rock. Their boundaries are unstable. So when two plates grind past each other, they release tremendous amounts of energy. The formation of volcanoes is one result. These are places where the molten rock travels upward to the surface. Iceland began to form some 60 million years ago. The tectonic plates under the ocean drifted apart. Enough lava piled up on the surface to create solid ground. This ancient rock is under the waves today. As new lava reaches the surface and cools down, it pushes the old rock away from the center of the island. That's why the oldest parts of Iceland aren't 60, but only 16 million years old. The country's active lava fields are young in geological terms. Some of them are under 1,000 years old. Scientists consider the island a hot spot for volcanoes, pun intended. 
Nearly a third of the basaltic lava that reaches the Earth's surface in recorded history came from Icelandic eruptions. Fisher swarms, like the ones before the 2023 eruption, cover 30% of the Nordic country. For this reason, only a quarter of the island is inhabited. Norse Vikings were the first people to settle in Iceland at the beginning of the 10th century. Nature threw them a loud welcoming party. Just a few years after their arrival, they witnessed one of the greatest volcanic eruptions in history. Vikings came from a region without volcanoes, so they had no clue as to what was going on. Today, Icelanders are used to such events. This is good because their homeland is entering a new era of volcanic activity. Volcanologists suspect that recent events are an introduction to decades of more frequent eruptions. The peninsula that is home to Earth's youngest volcano is just 17 miles southwest of Iceland's capital city. It's been dormant for a long time. Present-day eruptions there are a reminder that the natural processes that created Iceland are still ongoing. Recently, scientists discovered that there's a historical link between volcanic eruptions in the north of Europe and glaciers. Our planet went through at least five major ice ages. These were exceptionally lengthy periods when the average temperature on Earth dropped. The result was the expansion of ice sheets across northern Europe and North America. The last ice age ended some 10,000 years ago. Researchers are still trying to fully understand how these glacial periods affected volcanic activity. They suspect that the sheer weight of all that ice disrupts the flow of magma underground. When glaciers retreat, the pressure is lifted. This makes it easier for lava to flow upward to the surface where it bursts. If you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park, you were probably mesmerized by its geysers, which spew superheated water and steam high into the air. But an even more intriguing thing actually hides underground. I'm talking about that underfoot plumbing system that makes those grand eruptions possible. About that, there's good news. Recently, researchers have succeeded in mapping the National Park's hydrothermal plumbing system with the help of a giant flying magnet. As a result, scientists have managed to document all these features in stunning detail. The thing is, Yellowstone houses the world's largest hydrothermal system. It contains over 10,000 features, like geysers, mud pots, hot springs, and steam vents. They're fed by a network of underground water pathways. Those get overheated by magma flowing underground. It causes the water to rise to the surface. Now, no one actually knows much about the workings of this system. But the newly created maps might finally shed light on it. Experts explain that their knowledge of Yellowstone has a subsurface gap. That's why it's often called a mystery sandwich. Scientists know quite a lot about the features on the surface because they can observe them directly. And they know what's going on in the magmatic and tectonic system several miles below the surface. But they haven't figured out what's happening in the middle yet. So I must tell you about that giant flying magnet used for research. It's known as SkyTem. It was attached to a helicopter and flown over Yellowstone several hundred times, scanning the ground below. The magnet is made up of an 82-foot-wide charged wire loop. Its main task is to generate a strong electromagnetic field. And since different kinds of material, like water or rock, respond to this field differently, scientists managed to create a few subsurface maps for the first time ever. The mapping technique also allowed the researchers to differentiate between magma and bedrock, since they have a bit different magnetic properties. And the team got a chance to see how the magma and water interact and create those mind-blowing geological features on the surface. The team got high-resolution maps to a depth of around 500 and 2300 feet, and low-resolution maps showing what's going on at a depth of up to 1.5 miles. At the same time, the researchers think that the hydrothermal system itself may stretch as far as 3 miles below the surface. If they're right, it means they've only mapped the top half of Yellowstone's plumbing system. Anyway, remember how I said that scientists know pretty much about the bottom part of the Yellowstone sandwich? They have such a good idea about the tectonic plates and deep fault lines because the park's frequent earthquakes provide them with a lot of opportunities to study different phenomena. 
In July 2021, for example, more than 1,000 earthquakes rocked the area. These days, the team of researchers knows much more about some famous features, like the Old Faithful Geyser or the Grand Prismatic Spring. They've also found out that individual hydrothermal features on the surface can actually be connected to others, which can be as far as 6 miles away from them. Another interesting discovery is that even though Yellowstone geysers and hot springs vary in size, shape, color, volatility, and chemical composition, they are mostly fed by very similar underground sources. That means that the difference between the features appears closer to the surface. Now, I'm sure you've seen the iconic image of Yellowstone with a large rainbow-colored spring, fiery orange at its edges. So what makes these hot springs so colorful? Surprisingly, these awesome hues come from microscopic creatures. The temperatures in the springs are so high, they can easily and quickly cook you. Plus, the water there is super acidic, like the liquid in a car battery. But there are certain types of heat-loving microbes that don't mind these crazy conditions. You can even say they're thriving there. So every ring of a different color is, in most cases, a ring inhabited by different bacteria. And each species is adapted to a particular temperature or pH level, which measures how acidic this or that environment is. For example, take the Grand Prismatic Spring, yes, the iconic one. Its rainbow hues likely hint at the diversity of microbes living there. So, starting from the center of the hot spring, you can see a beautiful aquamarine color there. That's where the water temperature is the highest, reaching 189 degrees Fahrenheit, because this area is right over the underground water source. The water there is too hot even for microbes. That's why what you see is mostly clear water. As for the reason for its blue color, it's the same as why the sky is blue. Sunlight hits the surface of the water, and the light scatters. But the blue light scatters the most, getting reflected back to your eyes. Now, the next ring of color is yellow, all thanks to certain cyanobacteria. The temperature in this yellow ring reaches 165 degrees Fahrenheit. If the conditions in the hot spring were a bit different, these bacteria would create a blue-green hue, thanks to a green pigment called chlorophyll. But since the sunlight hitting the spring is too intense, the bacteria start producing another type of pigment. It's called carotenoids. And guess what? It acts as a sunscreen for the bacteria. And since this pigment is orange, the normally green bacteria get a yellowish hue. And finally, we've got that bright orange color closer to the edges of the prismatic spring. It's a bit cooler there, around 149 degrees Fahrenheit. In this part of the spring, you can find several types of bacteria. They all produce substances that give the spring this bright orange color. And finally, right at the edges of the spring, the temperature is cooler, around 131 degrees, and a greater variety of microbes can survive there. All of them combined give the edges of the spring that red-brown hue. But scientists believe that people and their activity may have influenced the colors of Yellowstone's hydrothermal features. For example, in the past, the temperatures in the morning glory pool used to be much higher than they are today. That's why its color was a deep blue. But trash has started to accumulate in the pool, and some of it clogged the vent. This caused the temperatures to drop, which led to microbial growth. As a result, that pretty blue color turned into orange-yellow. As for Yellowstone's geysers, the most famous one is called Old Faithful. It got this name at the end of the 19th century because of how regular its eruptions were. This geyser is more active than the others, erupting about 20 times a day. Each of these magnificent events lasts from 1 to 5 minutes, and the fountain of steaming water can reach a height of 180 feet. Now, while talking about Yellowstone National Park, we can't but mention Yellowstone supervolcano, right? Supervolcanoes appear when huge volumes of magma are trying to escape from deep underground. Eventually, they burst through Earth's surface. Sometimes, all this magma gets stuck, unable to break through the planet's crust. And then, massive pools of pressurized magma gather at a depth of several miles. The pressure keeps growing because more and more magma is trying to get to the surface. At one point, a super eruption goes off. You don't necessarily want to be around for that. Over the past 50 years, the Yellowstone caldera has risen almost 3 feet. It shouldn't alarm you, though. 
experts are sure it's a natural behavior for Yellowstone. Periods of dome-shaped uplift are followed by the caldera lowering. Scientists think the supervolcano doesn't present any danger at the moment. For an eruption to happen, the magma inside has to be at least 50% molten. With Yellowstone, this number is just 5 to 15%. Even better, a recent study made the researchers believe the hot spot might be in a state of decline right now, even despite all the breathing and dome-raising activity. There have been at least three other super eruptions in the history of Yellowstone Volcano. They happened 2.1 million, 1.3 million, and 640,000 years ago, long before video. The most recent super eruption was dubbed the Lava Creek Eruption. It formed the Yellowstone Caldera after spilling out 240 cubic miles of rock, dust, and volcanic ash. No thanks, I'll pass. The latest super eruption of Yellowstone occurred 640,000 years ago, and it was long before Homo sapiens saw the light of day. But we were around during another, no less devastating natural disaster. This super eruption took place on the island of Sumatra around 74,000 years ago. That's when an erupting supervolcano wreaked havoc on huge territories sending up plumes of debris and ash that spread for thousands of miles and caused temperatures on the planet to plummet. The effects of this super eruption were visible as far away as southern Africa. Experts believe they could have impacted early humans there. By the time the volcano erupted, our ancestors had already been using stone tools and had likely known how to produce yarn. And some specialists even think that the Toba super eruption was so powerful it could push our ancestors to the brink of extinction. They claim that Toba might be the largest volcanic eruption to occur on Earth within the last two million years. The eruption disgorged so much pyroclastic rock it would be enough to cover the entire United States to the depth of a one-story house. About a third of that deposit piled up on northern Sumatra while a lot more ended up beneath the floor of the Indian Ocean. The super eruption left an elliptical crater lake around 60 miles long. The caldera is so large it's hard to feel that you're indeed in a volcano. Pumice deposits from the eruption remain in the canyon walls and go deep below the ground. There aren't many arguments about the amount of pumice and ash involved in this disaster. At the same time, experts aren't sure how much sulfur ended up in the atmosphere. Even some sulfur layers in the polar ice could be potential candidates. But so far, scientists haven't found any connection between them and Toba. But let's get back to the dramatic impact the super eruption had on early humans. It turns out some not only survived but even thrived after this natural catastrophe at least judging by the artifacts they made during and after the eruption. The disaster might not have posed a serious threat to those of our ancestors who took refuge along the coast. Genetic evidence hints that modern humans descend from a few thousand people that ventured out of Africa around 60,000 years ago. Why just a few thousand? According to some experts, the rest of our ancestors could have been devastated by the Toba eruption. After all, the supervolcano spewed out a thousand cubic miles of dust and rock in a flash, leaving a scar in the ground that was dozens of miles wide. All that dust and sulfur Toba sent into the atmosphere potentially cooled the surface of our planet, which led to the appearance of glaciers and the lowering of Earth's sea levels. And since Toba might have had an important role in shaping humankind, scientists have been working hard trying to understand precisely how early humans reacted to this disaster. In 2011, several researchers found an enigmatic soil sample in South Africa's Pinnacle Point, an archaeological site overlooking the Indian Ocean. This sample contained some volcanic ash. After examining the layer, they found more than 400,000 artifacts left by early humans. Those ranged from heat-treated stone tools to signs of fire and animal bones. Based on this finding, the team suggested that early humans on the South African coast thrived after the eruption, living in that area for thousands of years and improving their tools. 
The region might have served as a refuge during and after the Toba eruption. A 2009 study suggested that the eruption could have lowered global temperatures by 14 degrees Fahrenheit. It would have made survival tough elsewhere in Africa. If there had been a volcanic winter, it wouldn't have been as cold along the coastline. On the other hand, newer studies claim that Toba spewed out so much sulfur into the atmosphere that the resulting aerosols could have stuck together, which would have limited their cooling effect in the long term. In other words, right after the eruption, temperatures would have plummeted, but only in some regions. And after three years or so, the effects of the eruptions would have calmed down altogether, becoming not dangerous to humans. Well, apparently, more research is needed. Meanwhile, let's figure out if we should watch out for any volcanoes these days. Last year, thousands of small earthquakes shook the ground near Iceland's Svartsengi geothermal power plant. Magma rose to the surface there, and now it has opened wide fractures slicing through the small town of Grindavik. The ground there is still swelling, and an eruption might happen with little notice. But of course, that's not all. Over the planet, 45 other volcanoes keep rumbling. For example, Italy's Vesuvius, that infamous thing that finished the city of Pompeii in 79 CE. Over the last 17,000 years, the volcano has experienced eight explosive eruptions, followed by powerful pyroclastic flows. Dense masses of super-hot ash, lava fragments, and gases flowing at high speeds. The volcano's last eruption happened in 1944. Mount Rainier is one of the most dangerous volcanoes in the USA. Its high elevation, chemical composition, and proximity to Washington's Seattle and Tacoma suburbs and the volcano's ability to produce massive pyroclastic flows make Mount Rainier a threat to consider. The heat from this volcano could potentially melt the ice and snow covering it, leading to rapid downstream flows of debris, mud, and rocks. The Novorupta volcano in Alaska's Katmai National Park and Reserve formed in a 1912 eruption, which was the world's largest in the 20th century. The volcano sent almost seven cubic miles of ash and debris into the air. It also produced such a powerful ash flow that it created the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. Mount Pinatubo is located in a populated region in the Philippines. It became notorious after a 1991 massive eruption, which was the second largest eruption of the 20th century. More than 700 people lost their lives during that natural disaster. Today, more than 21 million people live within 62 miles of Pinatubo. Mount Agun, a continuously erupting volcano in Indonesia, had its last major eruption in 1963. It was one of the most tragic eruptions in the country's history. It lasted for 11 months, producing ashfall and pyroclastic flows that led to the loss of more than 1,000 lives and serious property damage. People saw ash plumes above the volcano throughout 2018, following the eruption in November 2017. Japan's Mount Fuji hasn't erupted since 1707. That year, a massive earthquake likely set it off. In 2014, experts warned that Fuji could be at risk of another eruption following the nine-magnitude earthquake that shook Japan in 2011. Experts believed the earthquake had raised pressure below Fuji. The eruption in 1707 sent so much ash and debris into the air that all this mass even reached Tokyo. Should Fuji erupt again, it would affect more than 25 million people in the surrounding areas. The eruption of Washington's Mount St. Helen in 1980 was one of the most destructive volcanic events in U.S. history. 57 people, as well as thousands of animals, lost their lives during that natural disaster. The eruption also destroyed around 200 square miles of forest. Experts think that Mount St. Helens' history of massive eruptions means that future catastrophes are bound to happen. The next explosive eruption might send large amounts of ash all over the Pacific Northwest. No wonder the volcano is under close monitoring. One of Indonesia's most active volcanoes, Mount Merapi, has been erupting for centuries. 
NASA claims that the biggest risk of this volcano is pyroclastic flows, which can spread over vast areas and harm loads of people. For the last time, Merapi erupted in January 2024, sending plumes of smoke into the air. These days, more than 24 million people live in the area surrounding this volcano. Whoa! Earth's surface is shaking. Long cracks split the ground open. Lava rivers are rapidly flowing down the slopes. Deafening noise is filling the air. Rocks and other debris are flying high up. Clouds of volcanic gas and ash cover the sky. Now, this is not a plot of a blockbuster disaster movie. It's what happens when super volcanoes decide to erupt. But this is likely not the scenario that will take place when the world's largest volcano, Mauna Loa, decides to finish its long, long nap. In 2021, scientists were sure it would happen soon. But so far, nothing. The volcano's seismicity keeps increasing and then going back to normal. But you never know when this giant will finally come back to life. That's why experts have been monitoring geological activity on Hawaii's largest island for quite some time. The Big Island of Hawaii is made up of five volcanoes, including the most active on the planet, Kilauea, and the largest, Mauna Loa. This gigantic thing makes up almost half the landmass of the island. And what lava Kilauea emits in one day, Mauna Loa could spew out within 20 minutes. That's what it did in 1984. While Mauna Loa's smaller sibling has been throwing tantrums for a while, the giant has been slumbering ever since its last eruption. But very recently, the Hawaii Volcano Observatory has recorded more than 200 mini-earthquakes below Mauna Loa. It likely means an increased flow of magma down there. Good morning! The volcano might be waking up, or not. If Mauna Loa did suddenly erupt, lava flows could reach the ocean and the most populated and touristy places, like Captain Cook, very, very quickly, in a matter of hours. In 1984, the last time the volcano erupted, lava got as far as the outskirts of Hilo on the other side of the island. That's where a campus of the University of Hawaii is found. Luckily, people had a few weeks' warning to get ready for the disaster. These days, locals have special go-bags ready with the most important stuff, including documents and money. Such precautions can come in handy in case of an emergency evacuation. Even though most Mauna Loa eruptions have so far only affected the summit area, several of them sent lava all the way down to the ocean. And you never know how powerful the next eruption will be. Now, what is the highest mountain on Earth? Mount Everest, you say? Well, it depends. From seafloor to the summit, Mauna Loa is a thousand feet taller than the famous Himalayan peak. The volcano is so big, it makes the Pacific plate it's sitting on literally slump under its weight. Scientists say that when this monster of a volcano erupts, the volume of lava coming out per unit will be life-threatening. Over its recorded history, Mauna Loa has been erupting regularly, almost every six years. And even though the last eruption of the volcano occurred about 40 years ago, scientists are certain it'll happen again. Now, remember the scene I showed you at the beginning? Well, you can relax. It's not likely to happen with Mauna Loa. The thing is, big island volcanoes, including Mauna Loa, aren't very volatile. That's because they're shield volcanoes. These volcanoes got such a name because they aren't really very high and resemble a warrior's shield placed flat on the ground. Shield volcanoes get formed by very fluid lava. It travels farther and forms much thinner flows than lava erupted from a stratovolcano, which is conically shaped and tall, like the infamous Krakatoa in Indonesia. So if, or should I say when, Mauna Loa erupts, there probably won't be ash clouds and tons of debris. The most dangerous thing will be lava. Since Mauna Loa is a shield volcano, its lava is extremely fluid and voluminous, which allows it to flow far and fast. Using theoretical vent maps, experts from the Hawaii Volcano Observatory have made charts of possible lava flows. They're kind of worried about earthquakes clustering at high rates. It likely means that lava is on the move under the surface. 500 to 600 earthquakes per day are a serious reason to be on high alert. On the other hand, it doesn't necessarily mean a disaster or inevitable eruption. Around a decade ago, 
Several earthquakes that happened at the same time signaled that something was happening under Mauna Loa. But an eruption didn't occur. Instead, half the volcano shifted a bit to the south. This way, it probably gave more room to magma so that it had enough space to stay beneath the surface. Now, let's get back to the catastrophic eruption we saw at the beginning of the video. That's what often happens when a supervolcano erupts. Those are volcanoes that have at least once had an eruption with a volcanic explosivity index of 8, which is the largest recorded number on the index. Supervolcanoes are often extremely large, with no cone at all. That's because they're typically the remains of gigantic magma chambers that once flared up, leaving behind a caldera. They're usually found over hot spots. Supervolcanoes can produce super eruptions, and when they do, they blow more than 240 cubic miles of ash, molten rock, and hot gases up into the air. In other words, four super eruptions could fill the Grand Canyon to the brim. Supervolcanoes get formed when gigantic volumes of scorching hot magma are trying to escape from deep underground. This magma rises close to the surface but can't break through Earth's crust. That's why a huge pressurized pool of bubbling magma gathers at a depth of only several miles. The pressure keeps growing because more magma is trying to get to the surface until, bam, a super eruption occurs. The most recent super eruption happened in New Zealand. Well, when I say recent, I mean around 26,500 years ago. Nah, I wasn't around then. That's when a supervolcano beneath the surface of Lake Taubo spewed into the air more than 300 cubic miles of ash and pumice. Imagine 500,000 great pyramids of Giza flying up at the same time. That's how incredibly powerful that eruption was. But the most exciting and confusing thing about the eruption was that the Taubo volcano simply didn't go off like many others. At first, everything was going as usual. More than 200 square miles of magma had built up under the surface, and the pressure was getting higher and higher. But after the rock cracked and the first part of lava rushed out of the crater, something went wrong, and the supervolcano took a break. Only several months later, the disastrous eruption shook the ground, and thousands of tons of lava, rocks, and ash flew high into the atmosphere. But the age of supervolcanoes isn't over. The most infamous of them all is probably the one in Yellowstone National Park. This giant handles at least three mega-powerful eruptions. And who knows how many smaller ones? If this monster erupted anywhere as strongly as it did 2.1 million years ago, it would spit out more than 588 cubic miles of red-hot material. You can probably picture it more vividly if I tell you that this volume is comparable to 65 million capital rotundas in Washington, D.C. piled together. Wow. Anyway, scientists are sure that Yellowstone doesn't present any danger these days. For an eruption to happen, magma inside must be at least 50% molten. With the Yellowstone caldera, this number is just 5 to 15%. But of course, Yellowstone isn't the only supervolcano on our planet. There's also New Zealand's Tabo you already know about, Japan's Eri Cauldra, California's Long Valley, Indonesia's Toba, any of them can one day produce a super eruption. There are also several so-called supervolcanoes that haven't lived up to this name yet because they've never produced anything like a super eruption. For example, in 1883, Indonesian volcano Krakatoa went off. The power of the eruption tore the volcano's walls open, and cold seawater rushed into its molten insides. The difference in temperature made the volcano blow up with a deafening boom. It was clearly heard 2,000 miles away in Australia. It earned the blast the title of the loudest sound in history. But even though the consequences of this event were truly catastrophic, it still turned out not powerful enough to be called a super eruption. So, you might have heard that Yellowstone National Park is sitting on top of a giant supervolcano. That's a reason why the area can boast powerful geysers and hot springs. But it also means that underneath Yellowstone, there is an enormous magma chamber. In 2015, researchers from the University of Utah found out that this chamber was much bigger than everyone had previously thought. They even found one more reservoir with magma under the top one. 
Apparently, the more spacious the chambers are, the more magma they contain. Together, the two reservoirs store a glob of magma that could easily fill the Grand Canyon not once, but 11 times. But you know the most worrying thing about the magma chambers? They tend to push against the ground above them. As a result, the land in Yellowstone rises about 1 to 2 inches a year. On top of that, Yellowstone has the status of an active volcano, and its volcanic explosivity index, yes, there is one, is 8 out of 8. Such a high number means that if this volcano erupted, it would be an apocalyptic event. To put it into perspective, the eruption of Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991, which is considered the most powerful in living memory, was given a mere 6 on the volcanic explosivity index. Ha! Loser! Now, let's figure out if there's anything to worry about. In March 2023, the University of Utah seismograph stations recorded 354 earthquakes in the entire region of Yellowstone National Park. Sounds like a lot. But keep in mind that the most impressive event of the month was a mini-earthquake of magnitude 3.7. It was part of a swarm of 106 earthquakes that began on March 29th and continued until the end of the month. Yep, earthquakes apparently also come in swarms, so be aware. Experts say that Yellowstone's seismic activity is, well, kind of more active than usual, but it's really nothing serious. A geophysicist working at Yellowstone Volcano Observatory called Michael Pollan claims that the volcano won't erupt anytime soon. For this to happen, there must be enough magma ready to erupt beneath the surface. There should also be enough pressure to cause this magma to rise. But neither of these conditions exist today. According to the expert, Yellowstone is stable now. At the same time, Poland and his team are keeping track of all kinds of underground activity, looking for warning signs of possible eruptions. Some of them can be the frequency of earthquakes and ground deformation. Thousands of mini-earthquakes, coupled with extreme changes in the surface of the ground in that area, can be alarming. The team also monitors the temperature of the park's thermal features. That's another noteworthy sign of a potential disaster. Park-wide changes in geyser activity, as well as gas and thermal emissions. So, despite the media claims that Yellowstone is due to erupt soon because the last eruption happened 70,000 years ago, that's not how volcanoes work. Experts say that it's one of the most popular misconceptions about volcanoes. They don't follow timelines. If a super eruption did happen, though, the most worrying thing for us would not be the lava flows, and not an earthquake that would most likely accompany the natural disaster. No, the worst consequence of such a super eruption would be ash and ash fall. Let's have a look at what it was like when the Yellowstone volcano erupted many years ago. There have been at least three super eruptions in the history of the volcano. The most powerful of them was 2,500 times more devastating than the terrifying eruption of Mount St. Helens in Washington State in 1980. As for the most recent super eruption, It was dubbed the Lava Creek Eruption. It formed the Yellowstone Caldera after spewing out an insane amount of dust, volcanic ash, and rock into the air. Recently, scientists have also learned about two other previously unknown super-eruptions that happened around 9 and 8.7 million years ago. The younger of the two is now considered to be the largest recorded event of the whole Snake River Yellowstone volcanic province. Anyway, let's have a look at what was going on all those millions of years ago. Because I wasn't around then, so we're all assuming this stuff based on evidence. The first signs of the disaster appeared long before the catastrophe broke out. For thousands of years, the heat had been welling up from within the planet's insides. It had been melting rock beneath the planet's crust and leaving behind huge chambers. They were filled with a pressurized mixture of semi-solid rock, magma, water vapor, and different gases, including carbon dioxide. All this scorching underground soup was expanding since more and more magma arrived with time. The land over the volcanic system was rising upward almost unnoticeably. 
A year before the super eruption, Yellowstone gave a warning. A burp, maybe? But that long ago, there was no one who could interpret these signals. Plus, those alarming processes were mostly going on underground. For example, decompression releases gas bubbles. While bursting, such bubbles can often power particular kinds of eruptions. Months before the eruption, small-scale earthquakes became more frequent and more intense. The ground in many spots all over the supervolcano got hotter than it used to be. Surface lakes and groundwater also became warmer. If people had been around at that time, they would have noticed unusual steam fogging in that area. Not long before the eruption started, the growing pressure pushed the ground over the magma chamber up. This created a dome-shaped uplift. Narrow cracks started to open along the edges of this dome. Imagine opening a bottle of soda after you've shaken it. Something like that was happening near the volcano. Eh, Think Mentos and Diet Coke. The pressure was released through the fractures when gases were bursting out from under the surface. So right before the disaster, the ground around the Yellowstone volcano lifted. Geothermal pools and geysers heated up to boiling temperatures and got more acidic than usual. The magma started to rise toward the surface. At one point, the rock roof of the magma chamber couldn't resist anymore, and the eruption kicked off. Small but constant tremors began to move the ground days before the catastrophe. But the real shaking didn't start until several minutes before the eruption. With a deafening roar, a massive column of lava and ash curled up into the air. Within several minutes, a pyroclastic flow rushed across the area at a hurricane force speed. Such a flow is a liquid mixture of half-solid lava pieces, volcanic ash, and hot expanding gases. It looked like an extremely hot toxic snow avalanche. With a temperature of about 1,300 degrees, it was burning everything in its path. The volcano kept pumping ash for days on end. For all living creatures, ash fallout was one of the most dangerous consequences of the eruption. Volcanic ash turns into glassy cement within seconds of being inhaled. Most animals didn't have a chance to survive. Even thick trees started to collapse under the weight of this dense substance. It only took a couple of days until a thick layer of ash covered huge territories. After the ash got into the stratosphere, the temperatures all over the world started to drop. The eruption was rich in sulfur, which is an effective sunblocker. That's why it soon got so cold that there was no summer in the whole world for the next several years. Animals couldn't find food and clean water. This natural disaster called the Gray's Landing Super Eruption was colossal. That's how researchers described it in their recent studies. It affected a huge territory. The streams of lava enameled an area as large as New Jersey in scorching hot volcanic glass. It instantly sterilized the land surface, wiping out all the plant life that had been thriving there before. Now, if such an eruption were to happen these days, it would cover Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming with almost three feet of toxic volcanic ash. Many regions would be plunged into darkness. Even the coast, where most Americans live, would experience problems with the spread of the ash cloud. It would destroy crops and contaminate pastures, ruin power lines and electrical transformers. Well, so I'm sure you'll agree with me, it's a good thing that such a disaster isn't expected to occur anytime soon. Hey, we got enough other stuff on our plate. Phew, you can finally send that last report for the day and breathe out. The weekend is around the corner. But just when you're about to hit send, you're alarmed by the low rumbling under your desk. Is it the light rail passing by? Unfortunately, that's not the case. It's a volcano speaking. What, here? In Arizona? That's right, the ground keeps shifting under Arizona, reminding us that Earth is alive. No panic though, let's arm ourselves with some context. 20 American states have extinct, active, and dormant currently sleeping, volcanoes. Among such states, you can find California, New Mexico, Nevada, Utah, and Colorado. On the bright side, Arizona's volcanoes are dormant at the moment, 
but it doesn't mean they won't go off in the near or not so near future. Now, how about traveling to Arizona to check the traces of its active volcanic past? They dot the desert landscapes of this state like spots dot a Dalmatian. There are entire volcanic fields southwest of Phoenix, east of Douglas, near Flagstaff, north of Kingman, and near the Mexico border. The most worrying thing about these fields is that even though they're not active at the moment, eruptions in this region might happen every thousand years or so. Well, the time seems to be up. The last powerful and destructive volcanic eruption occurred around 1,000 years ago at the Sunset Crater. Oh, this place is worth paying more attention to. And we will, but a bit later. First, we have to talk about hotspots. No, not that place where you can surf the web. In our volcanic context, a hotspot is a place where insane amounts of heat melt the overlying crust, Earth's thin outer layer, and form volcanoes. This heat rises from the mantle, which is located between our planet's dense, superheated core and the crust. Want to see an example of this type of volcanism? Welcome to the Hawaiian Islands. The Big Island has its active volcanoes because, at the moment, it's situated on top of the Hawaiian hotspot. The older Hawaiian Islands were once there too, but later they drifted off towards the northwest it happened because that's where the oceanic crust on top of which they sat, namely the Pacific Plate, moved. Now, look at the world's ocean basins. Yes, they're literally dotted with islands that sit on top of hotspots, like Hawaii, Iceland, Samoa, the Galapagos. Those are probably the most famous examples. But don't think that continents can't host hotspots. They can, but those are far less common. One of the most famous continental hotspots is, ah, I bet you know it. Yep, the one beneath the Yellowstone caldera. By the way, the caldera is a vast volcanic crater, especially one formed as a result of a massive eruption that led to the collapse of the mouth of a volcano. The Yellowstone hotspot is basically the creator of Old Faithful and the rest of the hot springs and mud pots for which the national park is famous. Speaking of Old Faithful, let's make a small detour and pay more attention to this wonder of nature. It's one of the most well-known geysers in the world. People have been coming from all over the globe to see it for more than a century. The cool thing about this geyser is that the likes of it can only form under very specific conditions. That's why they're pretty rare. Magma under the surface superheats pockets of underground water the pressure there keeps growing until it eventually pushes the water upward with immense strength. A certain volcanic rock with a high silica content lines the tunnel through which this water escapes. Basically, it creates a unique pipe that can withstand unbelievable pressure and heat created by the water erupting above the ground. Old Faithful was the very first named geyser in Yellowstone. If you come to visit it expecting the thing to erupt every hour on the hour, you're gonna be disappointed. On average, Old Faithful erupts every 91 minutes or so, which isn't that bad either. Plus, you can download a special app which will provide you with the approximate time of the next eruption. But be very careful while visiting and stay away from the site. The water erupting from the powerful geyser reaches 204 degrees Fahrenheit. The steam is even more scorching, up to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. It's hot enough to bake a cake. But let's get back to our volcanic hotspots. Scientists still don't clearly understand why there aren't many hotspot volcanoes on continental crust. One reason might be that the continental crust is much thicker than the oceanic crust, which is about four times as thick on average. Another reason could be that most of Earth's crust, about two-thirds of it, is oceanic. This means that there's less continental crust for hotspots to form under. Now, I bet those of you living in Arizona will appreciate the following info. We'll talk about a volcanic field right in the heart of this state, the San Francisco Volcanic Field. That's a massive area filled with over 600 volcanoes. 
Yes, they're mostly small, but it doesn't make them any less impressive. They're scattered across 1,800 square miles in northern Arizona, a giant territory. Interestingly, scientists are still debating about whether this volcanic field is actually sitting on top of a hotspot. But one thing they agree upon, the volcanoes in this area get younger as you move east. And this pattern matches up with the North American plate moving west over what could be a stationary hotspot beneath the surface of our planet. Cool, huh? The volcanic hullabaloo in that area started around 6 million years ago. So, in geological terms, it's relatively young. As for the most recent eruption, it happened less than a thousand years ago. The Sunset Crater, which I mentioned before, the one near Flagstaff, is the most famous vent from that eruption. The Sinagua people had to leave their homes at Wupatki Pueblo because of the eruption. That site is now part of the Wupatki National Monument. There, you can see how people lived in this volcanic region many years ago. If you go to explore this area, you'll notice that most of the volcanoes there are basalt cinder cones, small and steep. The Colorado Plateau has quite dry weather conditions. That's why the volcanoes haven't worn down much. Some of the best examples of those cones, like this one, called the SP Crater, still look like they appeared yesterday. But look around. It's not just cinder cones. The San Francisco volcanic field also has a stratovolcano, as well as some lava domes that formed from volcanic rocks with more silica than basalt you can find in places like Hawaii. It means they're thicker and don't flow as easily. Anyway, the stratovolcano is going to be one of the most epic sights you'll come across while exploring this volcanic field. Well, not the stratovolcano itself, but the San Francisco peaks, the remains of that giant formation. They stand tall at more than 12,600 feet. That's four and a half Burj Khalifas placed on top of one another. It makes the peaks some of the biggest landmarks in northern Arizona. They're not only stunning, but also sacred to the Native American people who have lived in the area for many generations. Now, unlike those super active volcanoes in Hawaii, the San Francisco volcanic field takes its time, thousands of years between eruptions. But you shouldn't relax just yet. Geologists say another eruption is likely to happen one day. It will probably occur in the remote eastern part of the field, away from big towns. Phew! And if that next eruption is anything like the one that formed Sunset Crater, it would be quite the show. Lava fountains and rivers of lava flowing. At the same time, the next eruption might not happen for centuries, maybe even millennia. Until then, the San Francisco volcanic field will remain a hidden gem of volcanic history, waiting for its next fiery performance. If all the volcanoes on Earth suddenly erupted together, it'd be loud. <laughs> We'd also have around 1,500 of these formations bursting at once. Now, normally it's just 10 to 20 volcanoes that are active each day. But what would the world look like if they all blew their tops simultaneously? Geologists think it wouldn't be pretty. Even if only the land volcanoes erupted together, it would set off a chain reaction way worse than anything we've ever seen before. The two big problems would be ash and volcanic gases. While the explosions in lava would be damaging for people nearby, the real danger lies in what happens next. A thick layer of ash would cover the planet, blocking out sunlight completely. No sunlight means no photosynthesis, which means crops would fade away and temperatures would drop considerably. And all this ash cloud could remain in our atmosphere for up to 10 years. Now, ash aside, there's also acid rain to worry about. Volcanic gases like hydrochloric acid and sulfur dioxide would mix with the atmosphere and fall back down as acid rain. This type of weather would harm the groundwater and ocean surfaces. Even if humans would find a way to survive up to this point, we'd have no corals and no other sea creatures around. Scientists have seen similar events in Earth's history at a smaller scale. Big volcanic eruptions have been linked to mass extinctions, when Mount Pinatubo erupted in 1991, it cooled parts of the world for two years. 
But the extra carbon dioxide from these eruptions could also heat the planet, the same way we turn our stoves to broil for that extra crispy layer on our casserole. Mm. Geologists also mentioned that there's evidence in our atmosphere that stuff like this may have happened in the distant past. During the Cretaceous period, carbon dioxide levels were way higher than today, which made it difficult for marine life to thrive. Who would survive all this? Probably just some extremophiles, these organisms that survive in harsh conditions like hot springs or deep undersea vents. As for humans, we could all lay low in underground bunkers until things clear up. Or build multiple space stations that could fit us all. Yeah, right. The chances of all volcanoes erupting at once, though, are very slim. Whew. That's because there isn't one giant source supplying all the volcanoes on Earth. Each one of these openings has its own deposit of magma, except for a few cases where they indeed share the supply. For example, in 1912, Nova Rupta in Alaska erupted alongside another volcano sharing magma. Scientists have also found evidence of magma hiding under volcanic areas, like under the Taupau Volcanic Zone in New Zealand. This magma can spread out horizontally for long distances, but it's still just a local feature. Even if we consider all the magma under Taupau as one system, it's not connected to other volcanic areas like Indonesia or the Philippines. Because the great majority are isolated, volcanoes can't sink up to erupt at once. The magma comes from different processes, like mantle decompression or adding water to the mantle through subduction. There's no way to make all these different volcanoes erupt together because of how tectonics work. Now, that doesn't mean we won't see interesting volcano activity in the future. Take an underwater area near British Columbia, where recently about 200 small earthquakes per hour have been noted. Deep beneath the Pacific Ocean floor, off the coast of Vancouver Island, magma is set to erupt, heating the water so much that it'll bubble like soda. However, this event will likely go unnoticed by anyone other than scientists. The anticipated eruption will most likely happen around 3 miles below the ocean surface. Scientists explain that the earthquakes range from negative to 4.1 magnitude, meaning only those nearby would feel any tremors. This unusual activity gives us a rare opportunity to study how the Earth's crust forms. The magma beneath the ocean floor is estimated to be almost 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit, but will cool rapidly upon eruption and contact with water. This runny rock will solidify upon contact with the seafloor, turning black quickly. This event will be useful for biologists, too, who will have the opportunity to study the marine animal's response to any changes, like run! Antarctica, often seen as a vast icy continent, also holds a volcanic surprise beneath its frozen surface. Researchers have identified over 130 under the western ice sheet alone making it the largest volcanic region on Earth. Most of these volcanoes, about 90, were only recently discovered in 2017. But could any of these Antarctic volcanoes actually erupt? Well, it depends on which volcano we're talking about. While these formations are relatively young in geologic terms, it's hard for scientists to tell if they're still active or not. There are only two confirmed active volcanoes in Antarctica, Deception Island and Mount Erebus. The latter, standing tall as the highest peak on the continent, has been continuously erupting since at least 1972. It's known for emitting gas and steam, and sometimes even throwing out rocks in what are called Strombolian eruptions. One of its most notable features is a persistent lava lake in its crater, a rare phenomenon due to specific conditions needed to keep the surface molten. For instance, it's fueled by a steady supply of magma from deep within the Earth's mantle. This continuous inflow of molten rock provides the material for the lava lake to exist. It also features low ambient temperatures. Despite its location in Antarctica, Erebus has relatively mild temperatures in its summit region because of the heat generated by the volcanic activity. This allows the lava lake to remain liquid rather than freezing over. Deception Island, another active volcano, last erupted in the 70s. While it's currently not showing signs of imminent eruption, it's being monitored closely for any concerning activity. 
Apart from these two being confirmed to be active, Antarctica is dotted with fumaroles, openings in the Earth's crust that release gases and vapors. Sometimes these fumaroles can create icy towers reaching heights of 10 feet. What we should focus on is maybe supervolcanoes. They're this type that has the potential to produce the most massive and destructive eruptions. Unlike the typical one, which has a single vent, supervolcanoes have a vast magma chamber beneath the surface, spanning tens or even hundreds of miles in diameter. Their eruptions can have catastrophic effects on the surrounding area and even impact global climate patterns because of the amounts of ash and gases they spill out into the atmosphere. One famous supervolcano is the Yellowstone one, which some say is gearing up for another eruption. It has the capacity to unleash a colossal eruption, spewing over 240 cubic miles of material. As much as we'd like to predict its behavior, volcanoes don't stick to a calendar. Hmm. On the contrary, eruptions simply happen when there's enough magma beneath the surface. There also needs to be enough pressure for the magma to travel upwards. As far as we can measure, these conditions are not currently met at Yellowstone. Sure, many volcanoes operate on a cyclical pattern, but that doesn't mean Yellowstone is overdue. In fact, Yellowstone has had just three major eruptions over the past 2.1 million years. Also, the term supervolcano refers to the formation size, not necessarily how fussy it is. Yellowstone's monitoring is extensive, tracking seismicity, ground deformation, thermal emissions, gas, water chemistry, and surface changes. Signs of an eruption would include thousands of earthquakes over a short period. We'd also see deformation on the ground and weird gas emissions ahead of time. Stable as it might look like for now, the consequences of it having a major eruption could look ugly. Ash dispersion could blanket a 500-mile radius potentially disrupting Midwest agriculture and clogging waterways. Ash and gas emissions into the stratosphere could induce global climactic effects, making our planet colder for several years. And yes, we've seen some research that it shows there's more liquid molten rock under the Yellowstone volcano than scientists believe. But that doesn't translate to imminent danger. The largest volcanic region on Earth is not in Africa or Japan, but under the ice of Antarctica. Scientists found 138 volcanoes in its western part, and if they decide to go wild, you'll surely notice it. They could melt huge amounts of ice that will move into the ocean, raise its level, and make our planet uninhabitable for humans. But before you pack your things to fly away to another planet, hear me out. Only two of the Antarctic volcanoes are officially classified as active now. And it would take a whole series of eruptions, decade after decade, to seriously impact the whole world. Mount Erebus, one of the two Antarctic volcanoes currently in action, proudly bears the title of the world's southernmost active one. It has been continuously erupting since at least 1972. It emits plumes of gas and steam and sometimes even spews out rocks. And scientists call it Strombolian eruptions. One of the coolest features is a lava lake in one of its summit craters, with molten material on the surface. Such lakes are rather rare, because they need certain conditions to make sure the surface never freezes over. The second active volcano is Deception Island, a horseshoe-shaped landmass. It is the caldera of an active volcano that last erupted over 50 years ago. Scientists who monitor it say it shouldn't go wild anytime soon. Antarctica also has plenty of fumaroles. Those are volcanic vents that release gases and vapors into the air. In the right conditions, they can spew out enough stuff to build fumarolic ice towers up to 10 feet tall. Scientists keep an eye on the Antarctic volcanoes with seismometers that detect when the Earth starts trembling from volcanic activity. Sometimes they also use more complicated tech, but it's all really challenging because of how far away this polar region is and how tricky it is to get there. That's why no one can predict when one of the continent's volcanoes that are now sleeping might erupt. We can guess what this waking up would look like if we analyze the events from nearly 20,000 years ago. So, shall we? One of Antarctica's sleeping volcanoes, Mount Takahe, had a series of eruptions and spewed out a good amount of halogens rich in ozone back then. 
Some scientists say these events warmed up the southern hemisphere. Glaciers started to melt and help finish the last ice age. For these events to repeat, we'd need a series of eruptions with substances rich in halogens from one or more volcanoes that are now above the ice. It's an unlikely scenario, but since it already happened in the past, it's not completely impossible. As for volcanoes hiding under a thick layer of ice, it looks like their gases would hardly make it to the atmosphere. But they would be strong enough to melt huge caverns in the base of the ice and produce a serious amount of meltwater. The West Antarctic ice sheet is wet and not frozen to its bed, so this meltwater would work as a lubricant and set the overlying ice into motion soon. The volume of water that even a large volcano would generate in this way is nothing compared to the volume of ice beneath it. So a single eruption wouldn't make a difference. But several volcanoes erupting close to or beneath any of the western Antarctica's big ice streams would. Those ice streams are rivers of ice that take most of the frozen water in Antarctica into the ocean. If they change their speed and bring unusual amounts of water into the ocean, its level will rise. As the ice would get thinner and thinner, there would be more and more new eruptions. Scientists call it a runaway effect. Something like that happened in Iceland. The number of volcanic eruptions went up when glaciers started to recede at the end of the last ice age. So it looks like, for massive changes, several powerful volcanoes above the ice with gases full of halogens need to get active within a few decades of each other and stay strong over many tens to hundreds of years. Antarctica stores around 80% of all the fresh water in the world, and if they melted all of it, global sea levels would rise by almost 200 feet. And then we'd have to look for a new planet to live on. But this again is an unlikely scenario. It's more likely that the eruptions under the ice will lubricate ice streams and seep water into the ocean. But it wouldn't be the end of the world. A super strong, super angry supervolcano could do it, though. And it has already happened in the past. Over 200 million years ago, the world went through a major makeover with not one, not two, but four massive volcanic eruptions and huge pulses. The supervolcano called Camp had been erupting over and over for 600,000 years. It all happened in Rangelia, a large chunk of land that used to be a supermassive volcano stretching across what's now British Columbia and Alaska. And it wasn't the lava or the volcanic ash that ruined the environment. The eruption made carbon levels skyrocket. The planet would never be the same again. This volcanic activity might have helped dinosaurs grow from cat-sized critters into giants we saw in Jurassic Park. It kicked off a 2 million year rainy season. It made the whole world hot and humid. And the dinos just loved it. Researchers dug deep into sediment layers beneath an ancient lake in Asia to uncover these secrets. They found traces of volcanic ash and mercury clear signs of those epic eruptions. There were carbon signatures showing huge spikes in carbon dioxide levels. It made the atmosphere toasty, and the rain poured down. So the bad news is, another eruption like this could happen. The supervolcano beneath Yellowstone National Park has been sleeping for nearly 70,000 years. But if it wakes up, it would be many times more catastrophic than the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980. It's considered the most disastrous volcanic eruption in U.S. history. It followed two months of earthquakes and injection of magma below the volcano that weakened and destroyed the entire north face of the mountain. The eruption column went 80,000 feet into the atmosphere and spread ash over 11 U.S. states and several Canadian provinces. The last Yellowstone eruption was a thousand times greater than that. The ground above Yellowstone sits on a hot spot made of molten and semi-molten rock called magma. This magma stuff flows into a chamber beneath the park, about 4 to 6 miles down, making the ground puff up like a balloon. But then, as it cools down, the ground goes back to its usual state. Volcano watchers have been keeping an eye on this for a century. They noticed the ground lift up about 10 inches around 20 years ago. But since 2010, it's been going back down. The experts say we have no big eruptions on the horizon, so doomsday isn't coming anytime soon. But there's some underground activity going on lately, which keeps us interested.
Since humans haven't been around to witness every little thing Yellowstone does, it's kind of tough to say for sure what's brewing down there. Yellowstone has had some epic eruptions within the last couple million years. They happen like clockwork, with gaps of six to 800,000 years between them. The last big one was around 640,000 years ago, and it basically reshaped the entire landscape, spreading ash and debris as far as Louisiana. You can still see the aftermath of the last big eruption in the Yellowstone caldera today. Experts say a massive eruption, like the last one, is an unlikely scenario. We're more likely to see eruptions of steam and hot water or lava flows. When and with what force it will wake up remains a mystery to scientists.